Welcome to episode 65 of the series about security podcast for November 20th, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius Effort University. I'm joined again this week by Mike Hill and Keith Watson, and I will have the first uh, topic today. And uh, two weeks ago, we talked about um, a leak uh, that mentioned that the NSA had put some taps apparently between the data centers of Yahoo, Google, and I don't know if there were any others on that list. Um, and uh, and not surprisingly, Google and Yahoo were a bit upset about this fact that their data centers, their traffic between their data centers, has essentially been compromised. So um, after that announcement. Uh, Google and Yahoo have both said that they will begin encrypting the data between their data centers soon. And um, I, I specifically uh, found the Yahoo uh, article um, that they had posted, uh, that the CEO had posted on uh, Tumblr, which is owned by Yahoo, um, talking about their, their uh, rollout. And um, they talked about uh, moving to uh, 248-bit keys across their network by J January 8, 2014 uh, for the email. And uh, their goal is to encrypt all information that moves between their data centers by the end of the first quarter of 2014 and offer users an option to encrypt all, encrypt all data that flows to and from Yahoo by the end of the quarter one of 2014. And uh, I guess work closely with our international mail partners to ensure that Yahoo co-branded mail accounts are HTTPS encrypted. So I guess by the end of the first quarter of 2014, their goal is to pretty much be encrypting everything, or at least offer the ability to encrypt everything, um, which I think is is good. I mean, I don't. I think most Google services are already encrypted. I don't know if there's any unencrypted Google services, but. Uh, I don't know about Yahoo. Just some plain web search, I think. Yeah, if you're not signed in. Right, that, I guess that's not encrypted. Unless you have HTTPS everywhere. Then it's true. So you the HTTPS version. So, um, but Yahoo's goal is to encrypt everything, offer the users an option to encrypt everything by the end of the 2014 and have all their data between their data centers encrypted by the end of that time as well. And. Um, I think we talked about it two weeks ago, but um, there was supposedly an expectation that there, these, these were private lines between their data centers and that they were you know, pretty much immune to this type of, this type of spying, but obviously well, we discovered that's not true. Yeah, not necessarily immune to it because you have know, been able to tap fiber optic cables for a while problem being that they were actively doing this. Right, right. Moving from the theoretical, you couldn't do it to they were actually doing it. And so, yeah, part of the response from Google was they had already planned out their rollout of encryption between their links, and they accelerated that process due to the disclosure. Um, and Yahoo is following suit in that respect as well. Um, and they're also enhancing other aspects of their service, kind of, in, I think, almost catching up with Google in the terms of using a lot of their services with Google, like we mentioned already, HTTPS use in a lot of those, um, and Google's kind of, or sorry, Yahoo's following suit in that respect. Right. They're also doing something else, which I don't know if, if Google does that yet, and that is using a higher level of uh, security in their SSL for their Yahoo Mail, specifically encrypting with a 2048-bit key. I assume Google's probably using 2048-bit stuff for a lot of their stuff. I've not actually, I, I don't recall actually if they do or not. But that's another thing that they mentioned, um, which is also on their list of things to do. So I, I think it'll be interesting to see what other services take a similar attack in terms of protecting their inter-facility communications by encrypting those connections. Because the, the assumption is, well, if it's a you know, fiber that you own, you're not sharing it with anybody else. You own some part of the facility that connects the endpoints. And yet, we're finding now that 
that the NSA is attacking the communication link at some point. It's somewhat similar to your home networking, I suppose, in a way, in that you expect their network, your network between your computer upstairs and your computer downstairs or whatever to be secure, and you don't expect that to be tapped. I mean, it's a little bit different in that the fiber optic cables kind of run your hundreds of thousands or thousands of miles. And, and they, and anywhere in between, they could somebody could put something on them to tap them. But uh, it would be, it's, it's somewhat similar, I think. You, you, there's this expectation that you're, you, these, this data is going to be private, and you think, well, you know, I don't really have to encrypt data between my upstairs computer and my downstairs computer because, you know, nobody's going to well, expire on that now, right? <laughs> well, I guess the other issue here is. We have revelations about what the NSA has done. That doesn't rule out that other intelligence agencies aren't doing the same thing. So even if you, if one day the NSA said, oops, our bad, sorry, we're going to disconnect all our taps, what other intelligence agencies are not are out there listening, using the same techniques? And so ideally, the co companies like Yahoo and Google are going to say, it could be other groups. It could be attackers of some sort that are not funded by government agencies. Let's err on the side of caution and let's just encrypt everything we transfer between our data centers. Well, what I find interesting is that Yahoo's going to give users the option to encrypt all their data. Um, they're not going to just do that for the users. And I don't know if that is a performance issue for them or if it's, they just want to give users a choice. Um, but to me, a lot of uh, uh, users that are not as tech savvy are never going to know about that option and never enable it. And I'm just curious why, if they have the capability to do it, why not just encrypt all track? Why not just say yeah, maybe they, it all track? Well, maybe that's Q2, yeah. right? So it might be a rollout where they'll offer that as an option for people to enable it. Well, it may be a problem with. I don't know if they have third-party apps or whatever. There's they that use, they use, they use um, their services if they may be given time to rewrite the apps. Right yeah, it's it's similar to the Facebook better. apps moving to HTTPS. There was a transitional period where you could interact with Facebook over HTTPS unless you went to a third-party app, which then would drop you back to HTTPS. Right. Right. So, but that <coughs> they told all their developers, say, hey, you've got to provide an HTTPS option or it's just not going to be available on Facebook. And so eventually there was that transitional period and this might be something similar to that as well. Well yeah, and I, I hope this is a trend that is continued. I don't know, they don't mention what type of encryption they're going to be using, but I assume they're probably going to be using an AES type encryption, which is very quick, some sort of very fast uh, networking Equipment yeah, between the two, but they don't mention that. There's probably yeah. a lot of hardware security yeah. modules. Probably a lot of hardware. You know, most most of the hardware does some hardware based encryption. So, hopefully, hopefully they manage their keys well. Yeah, hopefully they manage their keys well. Yeah. When they change, they don't use the default key or whatever that comes with that. Of course, we'll keep going back to the argument. And they don't hand over the key. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's, there's the key. that, and there. there's also <laughs> the argument that, that Silent Circle would not use any government-approved algorithms, too. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. some of yeah. you that in this case, this won't be, that won't be the case here, because mm -hmm. um, AES is, has been optimized so much for quick encryption and decryption on yeah. hardware that it would be hard, probably, for them not to use that, which you have to wonder about that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hard to say. All right, well. Any other comments on this, or should we move on to the next next one? Yeah. All right, Mike. All right, you're well, up. We'll continue our talk about the government. Um, <laughs> as everyone's probably aware, <laughs> healthcare.gov has been under a lot of criticism since it was rolled out. Um, and uh, in the last couple of days, it's made security news. Um, some security experts were called before Congress to talk about healthcare.gov. And um, uh, David Kennedy of the information security firm Trusted Sec um, made the statement that uh, the, the site is vulnerable and that he's run some analysis. It, it's been vulnerable to SQL injection attacks and other types of attacks which he does not want to disclose um, because he doesn't want to give the hackers an upper hand. He doesn't want to give them an easy way to get in there, but uh, basically made the statement that the, the site is vulnerable. 
and um, and basically implied because of the sense, the type of data that this site is collecting, um, you know, they are concerned about that. Um, what I find what I found interesting was an article just a couple days earlier was posted by Sophos talking about how um, the healthcare.gov site has been put through a number of tests, the pin testing and denial of service attacks, and it's it's holding up well. So there's clearly a difference of opinion here regarding the healthcare.gov site, and, and I tend to side with the uh, security experts that, that testified. I tend to believe their testimony a, a little more. And uh, out of the, the four that testified, uh, all of them said that uh, Americans should not be using the site at present um, based on the security the security issues they've uncovered. Um, and Kennedy, he, he made a, a, a good analogy regarding um, kind of adding on security. Uh, that, that the security wasn't built into the site initially, but they've been adding it on. And, and he made the analogy, when well, you can bolt a metal door to make a house better, but the foundation is bad, you know, use your imagination, that, you know, that the house is still going to crumble. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, that, that bolted metal door, yeah, that's, that's strong, but there's lots of other ways in. And it, it's a weak foundation. So, um, I thought this was a very timely article, <laughs> considering that uh, I, I believe, uh, I don't follow the news all that closely, but I believe that the intent is by December 1st, this site is solid and secure and, 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 and working, and that's what, um, just a couple weeks away now, so um, I thought this would be fun one to, to discuss because I, I think the government's trying to put some information out there that yeah we're we're we're, we're pen testing this we, you know our results are the site is secure and yet you have these independent firms that are also running some tests saying no no th this site has many vulnerabilities and and should not be used so um, who who should we believe in this situation? Well, uh, I tend not to believe the government, but that's just my <laughs> inner conspiracy nut uh, talking there. Uh, mostly because what I've seen a lot with any any sort of IT project related to government, they layer on a tremendous amount of requirements. They hire loaded contractors to implement them, and they pay a lot of money for it. And then they wonder why it didn't work or it got or it failed, and they had to cancel. Right. The other guy is a great example of that, where they had, they had a case management system, they spent a million dollars in seven years trying to implement it, and part of it was the government kept coming back, or the FBI kept coming back and saying, oh, it needs to do this, oh, it needs to do this, oh, it needs to do this, and they kept doing scope creep on it and, and, and feature creep, and to the point where the contractor was trying to implement all of the, of the requests made, and in the end, they had to cancel it because the system didn't work. There was no way it was going to work because instead of you know, shrinking the size of the project to a reasonable manner because of the way government uh, allocations for funding work, you had to ask for a big project up front to get enough money to build it. You couldn't say, oh, I need five million this year and 10 million the next year. It didn't work that way. So you got a big allocation of money, you had to spend it the right way. Well, they don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with, is true, I think, with this healthcare site. The intention was go big or go home, right? And that's not typically how we want to build an application, especially when it's got a lot of sensitive data on your citizens in it. And, and also because of the time, the compressed timeline of getting it done, because I believe, if I remember right from other reporting, that the contractors were waiting to get started on it because the government was still compiling their requirements for the site. Yeah, I have. I, I was just going you know, to say I have a hard time believing that a site that was done in such such an expedient manner could have been completely tested for security flaws and and, and issues. And it seems like um, you know. I'm sure all the security procedures that you should follow were not followed in this case, and because uh, it seems to me like the the pressure on the the company was to get it out and get it going, and not to make it secure. Well, the many companies. The many. The many companies. Not just yes, one. <laughs> the many companies were to get it out and get it secure, which creates its own yeah. challenges when you use many companies because it becomes easy to say that fell 
I'm Preston's company, not mine. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's that responsibility yeah. was a lot of our company. Yeah. That's true. Uh, we, we weren't charged with that. We, we had responsibility for another module. Um, I, I think uh, another piece of information that's interesting in these articles is that a memorandum was circulated on September 27th between two the Department of Health and Human Services officials that basically said the site had not been properly tested and that it was creating a high risk situation. So there were some folks ahead of the launch that said, you know, I'm a little nervous. I don't think we're quite ready. Um, and I know those are probably the things that the government probably doesn't want us to know. But um, I, yeah, I, I think. As a developer, I do my best to, to write secure software. I mean, I, I have the CISSP, um, and I take that into consideration. And, and I know some of the comments were, well, security built in. I think it's great. I think you need to think about security at the start. But I can tell you when you're trying to get stuff to work, or at least when I'm trying to get something to work, sometimes it's like, OK, uh, it's not working this way. I'll do it the insecure way. Oh, OK, now I've got it working. Now I can, now I can add in this layer of security. Now I can add in this other layer of security. And as Preston mentioned, when you're pressed for time and people are saying, get it out the door, <clears throat> how, you know, do you have time to get all those layers to Yes, and them? when you're fixing bugs with sites, you fix them and make the site work. You don't necessarily make it work in a secure way as a software developer, unfortunately. And there's a lot of bugs in the site that aren't necessarily security bugs that need to be fixed. So. You know, it's, uh, well, the question I would have, and I don't know that we've seen it, is was the security process built into the software development life cycle? And part of the problem is we're still in the software development life cycle. <laughs> you could call this the beta version. <laughs> Sadly, uh, as we know, sometimes beta beta releases happen prior, you know, to the point when they're actually working correctly. And this might be a case of that. Uh, being the shortened time schedule that they were under that, you know, this is the beta release, sadly. It's not production ready yet. Well, yeah, and that's the thing, you know, you would think. I, I mean, the thing I'm surprised about is this is a this is a huge application. They knew how many millions of people were gonna need to access this. You know, so you wonder why did they do like a phase rollout? Truly, truly do you know beta testing? Say for the month of October, we're going to allow up to 100,000. You're going to be selected to participate, monitor the traffic, see sure. You know what? We we are not managing this well. We have some issues. Let's well, firm these up before I, I we think, open it up bigger and bigger. And and, and I think the the disconnect here is there's the idea of commercial software release. That is, man, that is facilitated and managed by a company who has a business driver. And then there's government product release, which is driven by legislation and timelines that are in law. And the motivation is a little different. And so that's, there's a disconnect there, whereas the, the, the company can invest the resources to get it done when it's ready and do the beta release and introduce a small number of customers first but they're under time pressure of the government because they need to have people signed up by April, March, April next year. And that shortens the amount of time available to citizens to sign up. Right. And so the, the best plan is to put it into production as soon as possible. And sadly, it's not ready for that yet. <laughs> but yeah, and I would argue that that wasn't the best plan. The best plan would have been to retroactively go back and say, we're going to bring this many users on this time, this time. Right. Like you said, if you go sure, all the way sure. out to April, you can come up with a plan and say, well, something's got to be available October 1st, but it doesn't have to be available to everybody. You know, do what the law said that it had to, and that's the problem. Well, maybe the people writing the laws and then the law said, software development. The law said, said on October 1st, <laughs> you can start something. Of course, they don't understand the software development life cycle. And, well, no, they don't understand software development or the production of right. software. They don't understand software, period, in some cases. But they also. Um, haven't written a law to be flexible in a way that would allow that process to work in a little more yeah. reasonable way. 
Yeah, and you wondered as well, um, and, and we're delving into the land of politics now. Yeah, and I don't want to go too much in that, but, but I wonder as, as the contractors, because we've worked on some government projects in the past as well, that it seems, this memorandum seems to indicate to me that some people, at least by the 11th hour, are like, whoa, 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 we we're going to probably have some issues. I mean, I wonder how many of these contractors stepped up and said, you know what, this thing's not ready. I mean, yes, there's a law Fair saying it, but, but, but to me, the, the thing, I, the impression I get from the politics and from the news is, I think the administration was thrown off by this. I, I, at least that's the perception they're giving us. I, you know, it's like, I, I don't think they knew it was this bad. And I think maybe if they had felt at all that it was, maybe some, you know, maybe there could have been some additional information being well, said ahead of time. Then that falls into the land of project management, <laughs> <laughs> which is a whole other bailiwick of stuff. Um, also, something the government may not do correctly yeah, yeah. as well. They've certainly written tons and tons of paper and documentation and process and procedure for project management, but uh, this is another good example where they didn't apply what they've already taught. The DOD has taught everybody else about how they would expect projects to be done. Yeah, there's, there's definitely some communication issues, I think, because I, I think, you know, from what I've seen, you know, there were there were comments, you know, back in April, May of this year that we're on track. Of you know, at some point, somebody knew it wasn't looking good. I, I think, yeah, I, I think, it, I think somebody was some aware that. that they <laughs> Passed that along up the tree, yeah. but the, the command that came down was so get it done. So get it done. Yeah. And and then you know now we're going to delve into the land of how you do software implementation. Um, and one and you may be familiar with Brooks Law. Anybody? Brooks Law says that if you have a late software project, adding additional resources to that project only makes it later. And there's the, the idea is that you have to bring the new people up to speed. Yeah. You have to yeah. take the people who know what's going on out of the work of the area to get these other people up to speed. You just delay a project further. And so the command down might say, well, put more put more logs on fire. Right. But in software development, that actually slows down a project. And what the I the better approach is shrink the scope, right? You're not gonna be able to deliver as much, so deliver less. But again, the law, the law boy comes boy. in and says, you can't, you got to have everybody, and they got to start on October 1st, I don't know. So, yeah. So. Yeah, which led us to where we are now, so I'm I'm sure they've got, they've been throwing as many logs on the fire as they can. Let's <laughs> just so, it's it's good help. Help. Let's just hope there's not some day breach or something like that, and uh, or the site doesn't start getting hosting malware. Well, there's that. Those are, but, those are the two things that I think could ultimately well, happen, and if they do, that would be bad for everybody involved. Yes, it would, but <laughs> uh, it might motivate further government action on the whole uh, criminal attacker area, which they complain about a lot, but they do little for. Yeah, it may. So, you know, we'll we'll see. We don't want to see that. Well, but sadly, well, I think that's a reflection of kind of how some of these things roll out too. I, I think we've, I, I, we've talked about this in previous podcasts. We, we've gotten used to, you know, oh, you know, a, a new software version rolls out for my phone, it's not working well, well, patch is coming. Uh -oh, I'll just wait for the next patch. You know, this feature got broke out, the next patch will fix it. We've become accustomed to, ah, just patch it, you know. Roll something out when it's not ready and just wait for the patch. And uh, unfortunately, that's, I think maybe the government can get away with that a little more than the commercial entity because the government's going to continue on. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know what? It's a law. Like you said, it's the law. They, if you had a choice of multiple websites and healthcare.gov was one of them, there, it was open competition, and the other sites were secure and running well, <laughs> even with a smaller scope, you'd probably be using those sites. But guess what? You don't have a choice. So that's going to be the site. Um, and whatever happens, you know, they'll just patch it and it'll move forward. <laughs> All right. Well, I have lots more. Ooh. All right, do you want to end on that? All right. Well, thanks, Mike and Keith. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.